Bob Hillier exemplifies the mission of St. Edward's University in his attention to seeking justice for his clients, dedication to his profession, and joy in his family. Join me in welcoming Bob Hilliard to deliver the commencement address. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sister Donna, deans, my good and old friend, Richard Daly, who I love seeing. And you guys, congratulations. You know, I've sat where you sat, but I've also sat where y'all sit, the moms and dads who are looking down with uh, love and admiration at their children. So congratulations to you as well. I know what that trip is like. You know, when I came here in uh, 1976, uh, my mom and dad walked me out the front door. Uh, my mom gave me a kiss. My dad said, good luck. And I jumped in my Toyota Camry and I drove five hours to Austin. No cell phones, no computers, uh, pay phone down the hall. And once a week, someone would knock on my door saying, uh, your mom's on the phone. And I'd say, I'm not here. <laughs> You know, I talk to my kids every single day, either on Facebook or uh, instant messaging, and the communication is different than it was then. Um, when Alex was four and I took him to his first day or second day of preschool, he had been reading a book at home about how time flies, so I dropped him off at school and I came to pick him up at the end of the day and he looks at me and he says, Dad, I just got here. I was just playing. and..." And he was trying to figure, remember that saying, and he says, and a fly went by. <laughs> and I tell you what, as I look around this campus, and I, it seems like yesterday I had that Toyota Corolla, uh, I shake my head because a fly went by. Um, so I have eight minutes to either confirm your paradigm on what you're going to do with your future or change it. And uh, I got this. I can do it. <laughs> here's, here's my thoughts. If I was sitting where you were sitting in 1980 and somehow the 53-year-old me came up to give the talk uh, and he picked me out and he said, let me tell you what your next 30 years will be like. Um, and he wouldn't be as, he'd be, maybe he'd be as kind as Sister Donna, but he'd also be uh, pretty realistic. Um, and I'd be listening to him thinking, you got the wrong guy. You know, I have my plans for my life. I know what I'm going to do. And none of that sounds like anything uh, that I plan to do. And the old saying that I learned actually while I was at St. Ed's is, God is a comedian playing to an audience afraid to laugh. And so what you have to do uh, as you go forward, uh, think about it this way. Let's say that the 53-year-old you found you today and said, let's go down to 6th Street, drink a beer. And got to telling you a little bit about what uh, was really going to be your life. Three things would be true after that. Number one, the life that you sit there right now thinking you are going to lead is not the life you will lead. That is an absolute truth. The second thing is you will do more than fine. You may be fretting right now about getting into a graduate program, about getting a job, about, man, I don't want to move back home. <laughs> but you might. Uh, and the third thing that will be true is if you accept those two things, if you accept that those two things are true, you will free yourself today to begin to try and figure out what you want to do that's going to allow you to be comfortable in your own skin. You know, the, the quicker you start what I call the self-archaeological dig of your own person, uh, the longer you will live life without looking in the mirror and going, a fly went by. You don't want to do that. Sometimes the best way to feel most alive is to think about death. The 53-year-old you is a reminder, but death is the great reminder. You know, I am completely stunned and awed by the beautiful absurdity of the messiness of life. And sometimes I am struck by the suddenness with which it can end, with no expectation. People who 
go to funerals, people who have a loved one who suddenly die, are often people who say, you know, I'm not living the life I want to live. I want to do something else. And as I was getting ready to talk to you, I mean, that, that, that is really uh, uh, probably the most powerful life-changing event is the death of a, a loved one or the death of someone close to you. And there was an article I actually read last week about the five biggest regrets of people who are dying. And the, the number one regret, I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. And I know sitting there right now, it's tough because you really don't know yet how to be true to yourself. You know, you're just figuring it out. You know, you're not sure that if you take a job, if that's what you want to do, and suddenly, you know, a fly goes by, and you have kids, and you have a mortgage, and you can't move out, or you can't do anything. Uh, so the only way to grow, to mature, as you will continue to do, as I continue to do, as my children continue to do, is to stay awake. Do not, do not, do not become an uninterested observer in your own life. Stay in the middle of it. Um, it will work itself out. You know, the, there is no blueprint, there's no dean of your specialization that can say, here's the blueprint of your future from now on. Here's what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And maybe that's the key. You don't want a blueprint. You want to lean into the discomfort of trying to figure out what am I going to do? How am I going to do it? And with whom do I want to do it? I'm not going to stand up here much longer, but there's, there's one other thought that I'm going to give you. And that is, uh, it, it comes from a brother that's not here anymore that taught me British literature. And I tell you, the echoes of all the brothers that were here and are not here anymore are still in my head as an English literature major. Uh, you know, they, they all seem to give you literature on the existential angst of trying to figure life out. Uh, but Brother Simon, uh, had a story that he used to make us read called The Point of No Return. And it was about this guy that would never be comfortable unless he was on a trip and he got to the point where it was closer to get to the destination than to turn around and get home. And with all the distractions that we have today with our computers, with, you know, with, with texting, um, it's hard to put it down, stay in the moment, turn to the person next to you and say, it's good to see you again, Richard, and listen to them. But if you, can, if you can do that, if you can stay in your own moment, it's like the guy that's standing on one side of the river and he's, he's not even looking around him. He's looking across the river and he sees green trees and he sees grass and it looks so nice to him. He's just staring there longingly looking at it and he sees someone on the other side and he yells, hey, how do I get to the other side? And the guy looks at him and says, you are on the other side. This is your place as you go forward. This is where you should be as you try to figure things out. Um, all of you folks and I, we have one thing in common, and all, everyone else in here, and that is one day we will be the vaguest, vaguest memory of our great-great-grandkids. And maybe one day one of those great-great-grandkids will be named after you one of you. And maybe that great grandchild will ask his mom or his dad, who was I named after? And that mom or dad would say, well, you were named after um, you know, your great grandfather or your great grandmother, whatever your name is. And the child will look at his parents and say, well, what were they like? And the parent will say, well, let me tell you. That blank is what you start to fill in right now. Don't wait. This is a perfect time for you. This is not the starting line of your life, but it is the starting line of something new. You fill that blank in the way that you want to fill it in. You enjoy the ride. 2011 graduating class, I salute you. Congratulations.